Welcome to uh, week two, lecture, lecture two. Today's lecture is going to be on logic, the science of reasoning. What is logic? Logic is the study of the principles and concepts of good reasoning. Yes, there is such a thing as bad reasoning. That's why logicians are not interested in why people reason the way they do. But they, rather, they are interested in, uh, in the principles of reasoning. Uh, in other words, what makes reasoning good? What makes an argument good? What are the elements that make an argument good? This is what we're going to talk about. First of all, before we uh, talk about arguments, logical arguments, I want to talk about a very important distinction in logic. The distinction between analytic and synthetic. Now, any sentence, as you all know, has a subject and a predicate. A simple subject-predicate sentence can be either universal or particular. For example, I can say, all bachelors are unmarried men. Or a particular, my house is small. Now, what is an analytic statement? An analytic statement is one that has a predicate concept contained inside the subject concept. Let me illustrate what I mean. <clears throat> Take this statement. All triangles are three-sided figures. This is a true statement, isn't it? Which is the subject? The subject is triangles. And the predicate term is three-sided figures. So, triangles are defined as three-sided figures. So what, what I meant by the subject contained in a predicate, or uh, the predicate contained in the subject, I mean simply that if you analyze the concept triangle, and you analyze the concept of having three sides, you will discover that all triangles are defined as three-sided figures. Or in other words, the concept three-sided figures, something that has three sides, is a concept that is contained inside the concept of all triangles. It sounds more complicated to explain than it is, in fact is. In other words, what I mean is that a sentence is analytic when the concept that is expressed by, by the, the predicate and the concept that is expressed by the subject are the same. In this case, notice that all triangles uh, are three-sided figures is a way of saying that all triangles are triangles or that all, tr all three-sided figures are three-sided figures. Another example would be um, all roses are roses. My cell phone is my cell phone. Well, let me give you another example. <clears throat> All objects occupy space. This is obvious, isn't it? Objects are those things that occupy space. They are extended in space. So the predicate concept, occupying space, once again, we speak of this concept being contained 
inside the subject concept object. Philosophers typically call these statements tautologies, where A is the same thing as A. Okay. Um, Plato either is either Greek or is not Greek. A rose is a rose, and so on. In other words, statement, a, an analytic statement is made of a predicate and a subject which express the same concept. These are called analytic statements. What about synthetic statements? A statement or a judgment is synthetic if and only if it is not analytic. But this is obvious. Now, to be more precise, a statement is synthetic when the predicate and the subject do not express the same concept. For example, all bachelors are tall. You see that in this example, the term bachelors is not the same thing as the predicate tall. Or in other words, bachelors and tall do not express the same concept. One is about tallness, the other one is about being a bachelor. Okay, They are different. When the uh, subject and the predicate do not express the same same concept, statements are called synthetic statements. What about this? New York City in the winter is lovely. Is this synthetic or analytic? If you answer synthetic, you are right because New York City and uh, lovely are two different concepts. What about this? The sun will arise tomorrow. Very good. If you answer synthetic, you're right. The sun will arise tomorrow. The subject and the predicate express Two completely different, different concepts. Now, <clears throat> what is the distinction between a priori and a posteriori? Don't get scared. A priori and a posteriori are Latin words. A priori means prior to, prior to experience. So think about it. What can you know prior to experience? Everything you experience, right? And what about a posteriori? That means through experience. Now let me give you some examples. All bachelors are unmarried, unmarried men, and some bachelors are happy. We know that these two statements are true, but how do we know that they are true? Think about the, the first statement. All bachelors are unmarried men. How do you know that all bachelors are unmarried men? Simply, you know it on the basis of the meaning of the word bachelors. In other words, you don't need an experience in order to know that bachelors are unmarried. What I mean is simply that you don't need to ask all the bachelors in the world if they are married or unmarried. You know that they are. How do you know it? Well, you know it on the basis of meaning. 
not on the basis of observation or experience. <clears throat> So a judgment, a statement, is a priori if it can be known independently of experience. If I tell you that I have a triangle in my pocket, you know that it has three sides without the need to see it. Why is that? Because you know that triangle means something that has three sides. Something that is true in all possible worlds. So put it this way. If, you are, if you're not sure whether a statement is a priori or a posteriori, here's what you do. Think about it. Is that true in all possible worlds? Ask yourself that question. For example, is it true in all possible worlds that triangles have three sides. In other words, can you imagine a world in which triangles, the triangles that you know, fail to have three sides? Would it be possible? It's absurd, right? It's not possible. Because if a triangle is defined as something that has three straight sides, there's no possible world in which something that has <clears throat> three straight sides has four or five or two. The definition restricts the meaning of that term. Now, let's look at the, uh, the second example. Some bachelors are happy. How do you know this? Well, certainly you don't know this by, by thinking about the, the term bachelors. There's nothing in the definition of bachelors uh, about happiness. I know some bachelors might say that they are because they're bachelors, but that's a bad joke. But if you look up in a dictionary the definition of a bachelor, what is the definition? Let's see. Hey Siri, what's the definition of bachelor? A man who is not and has never been married. Do you so, want to hear the next so one? So as you can see, even Siri defines a bachelor as a man who has never been married and he's not married. Um, Siri did not say comma, and also a man who is happy. Why not? Well, because happiness does not define bachelors, and bachelors do not define happiness. Okay? So how do you know that some bachelors are happy? Well, you know it on the basis of experience. In other words, you, uh, you can know that triangles have three sides just by thinking about triangles and the meaning of triangles. On the other hand, you know that some bachelors are happy only on the basis of experience, which means you have to uh, find some bachelors, ask them the question, are you happy? And uh, if they are, they will tell you, yes, I am happy. And so you, uh, you write it down and you report that some bachelors are happy. That's the only way that you can know. <clears throat> so as you can see, analytic statements, those statements where uh, the subject and the predicate express the same concept are also statements which are analytic and a priori, I'm sorry. In other words, all analytic statements are a priori statements. On the other hand, 
as you can see, synthetic statements are always known a posteriori. We always know them through experience. Now, there are prime numbers larger than Graham's number. Graham's number is the is bigger than the number of atoms in the observable universe, which is estimated to be 10 to the power of 82. That means 10 followed by 82 zeros. So is this statement an analytic or a synthetic statement? And it, is it a priori or a posteriori? How can you know if this is true? Well, it seems to me that there are prime numbers larger than Graham's number. You don't need a, an observation to do that. Why is that? Well, because you know the numbers are infinite. So uh, I don't care how big Graham's number is, there's going to be a number which is larger than that. And since there is an infinite number of prime numbers, there must be a prime number which is larger than Graham's number. So this is something that, as you can see, I demonstrated to you. How did I arrive at the conclusion? Just by thinking about it. I didn't experience numbers. I didn't need experience. So this is an analytic statement, and it's known a priori. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Well, you see that in this case, we have to measure, we have to do it. We have to take a straight line and, uh, and discover that the shortest distance between uh, two points is a straight line. So this is an example of a synthetic statement. And it's not known a priori, it's known a posteriori. Okay. Seven plus five is 12. Is this a priori or a posteriori? This is a tricky question. 7 plus 5 is 12. Well, think about it for a second. Hmm. How do I know if 7 plus 5 is 12? I can see that some of you might, might be thinking <clears throat> that this is an analytic statement, right? Because 7 plus 5 is 12. But think about this. What if I asked you, instead of 7 plus 5, I ask you uh, uh, some very large number. For example, 2,305,075 plus 1,300,560. Well, as you can see in that case, I don't know the answer immediately, automatically. I have to calculate it. So whatever the answer is, it's something that you cannot know prior to experience. And consequently, seven plus five is 12, is a synthetic statement, something that you know on the basis of experience. And so it is known a posteriori. That rat is a rodent. This is an easy one, isn't it? Think about how do you define a rat? The definition of a rat is rodent. So uh, this is something known a priori. 
Well, it is tricky because some people might not know what, what a rodent is. But the point is this. If I tell you what a rodent is and I tell you what a rat is, you will immediately see that this is a, a, a it's, it's an analytic statement. On the other hand, if I explain to you, for example, what happiness is and what a bachelor is, you're not going to see immediately that some bachelors are happy. But in this case, if I tell you that a rat is a rodent and a rodent, an example of a rodent is a rat, then you will know automatically that a rat is a rodent is an analytic statement known a priori. <clears throat> Ice is frozen water. This is an easy one. Ice is defined as frozen water. Children play with toys. This also is an easy one. It's a synthetic statement. And it's known a posteriori. There's no possible way for you or me or anybody to know that children play with toys unless they actually play with toys. It's something that you discover through experience. Very well. Planet Earth rotates on its axis. This is a synth synthetic statement, isn't it? Because it's not, uh, it's not obvious from the definition of Earth that Earth is a thing that rotates on its axis. Look it up in a dictionary, the meaning of Earth. How do we know that Earth rotates on its axis? Because we discover it through experience. All objects have weight. This is a tricky one. All objects have weight. Well, this is a synthetic statement, not an analytic statement. Why? Because an object is defined as something that occupies space. There's nothing about weight in the definition of an object. In fact, if you are in outer space, objects do not have weight. So if an object has weight, you have to discover it on the basis of experience. In other words, all objects have weight is a synthetic statement that is known a posteriori through experience. Stones thrown at windows break glasses. This is obvious. This is a synthetic statement. You have to do it in order to know what happens to the glass. A red object is colored. This is an easy one, isn't it? If an object is red, and red is a color, by definition, a red object is colored. How do I know that? I know it prior to experience. I don't need to see an object. I don't need to see a red object in order to know that a red object has a color. It is colored. Because if you say to me, I have an object in my pocket, guess what? It's red. Oh, then by definition, it is a colored object. New Orleans is the largest city in Louisiana. Is this synthetic or analytic? Obviously, it's synthetic. You have to discover it. 
New Orleans is not by definition um, the largest city in Louisiana. Suppose that they build another city which is larger than New Orleans. Then New Orleans would not be the largest. So it's just a contingent fact. It's an accident that is the, uh, the largest. Objects released in air fall downward. Is this a synthetic or a analog? This is uh, probably the trickiest of all. You see, it's not obviously true that objects released in air fall downward. You have to really experience it. By definition, objects are objects. They're not things that fall down when released in air. Consequently, this is a synthetic statement known a posteriori. Touching fire burns the skin. Once again, this is something known a posteriori. You cannot know prior to experiencing fire that fire will burn your hands. Hitting a billiard ball with a cue stick makes the ball move onto the table. How do we know this? Well, we know this because we, uh, we do it. We have an experience. You can't know this without any experience, just by thinking about it, a billiard ball. The sun is 92.96 million miles from Earth. Once again, this could be different. Earth could move or the sun could move. So it's just an accident. It's a coincidence that the sun is that far from Earth. In other words, it's a synthetic statement that is known on the basis of experience. Donald Trump is the president of the United States. If you answer that this is synthetic, you're right. It is synthetic and it's known on the basis of experience. Water drowns or water has the property of drowning. This seems obvious, isn't it? This is a synthetic proposition. It's not known independently of fact. You need a fact and you uh, have to experience that fact. So it's synthetic and a posteriori. Great job. Let's move on now. Let's talk about arguments. The definition of a logical argument is a group of statements in support of a conclusion. Remember this, this is very important. This means that a paper, a speech, a book, an article, an oral presentation can be arguments as long as they have certain premises, certain statements, and a conclusion. What is a conclusion? A conclusion is the main point or a thesis. So I mention a book or a paper or a speech. Now what about a poem? A poem is not an argument because typically poems are a group of statements arranged in a way that are uh, follow a certain musical, rhythmic uh, movement. But there's no main point in a, um, in a poem. I mean, what I mean is, there could be a main point. For example, a poem about New York City. 
Okay, the point is to describe New York City and to describe certain uh, uh, beautiful features of New York City. But contrast a poem with um, an English paper where you argue for something. Uh, you have a thesis statement. Okay, the thesis statement is that statement that you want me to uh, uh, to acknowledge. You are trying to uh, to make a point. You are trying to uh, uh, persuade a person into uh, believing in whatever that is that you want to uh, them to believe. Or a book. Once again, a book is not necessarily an argument. It is an argument if you write a book with an intent to show something that is not known. For example, the book written by, by a scientist, say on the topic of dark matter, would be an example of an argument where the, uh, the scientist wants to show a certain property of dark matter, for example. Or um, another example is the theory of evolution. Darwin's theory of evolution is an argument because it is a series of statements, well, many statements, many chapters, in support of a conclusion, which is, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that we evolved. All the species in the world evolved. Conversely, a book of fiction is not an argument. If you read uh, Shakespeare's uh, play, one of, one of his plays, that is not an argument. Now, granted that the, uh, the characters in that book might advance an argument, but the book itself that you're reading is just a story. Uh, if you ask Shakespeare, what's your point? He will respond, I have no point. My only, my only purpose is to write this book to entertain you. So you can have fun reading my story. But there's no point. So arguments are groups of statements in support of a conclusion. There are good and bad arguments. How do we recognize them? A good argument, we recognize them by two components, two requirements. The first one, that the, uh, the statements of that argument are true. This seems obvious. An argument cannot be good unless it has true statements. The second requirement is that the conclusion of the argument follows the premises either necessarily or probably. Now necessarily and probably imply two different ways to argue, which I am going to uh, illustrate. These two ways are what are known as deduction and Induction. If the conclusion follows necessarily, the argument is deducted. If it follows probably, it is inducted. If you are in Brooklyn, you are in the United States. You are in Brooklyn. Now, what follows from these two premises? And how does it follow? Well, it follows that you are in the United States. Think about it. If you are in Brooklyn, by definition, you are in the United States. I don't mean Brooklyn anywhere else. I mean the Brooklyn in New York's state, in New York City. So if you are in, this, in, in a borough of Brooklyn, by definition, you are in the United States. And let's assume that you are in Brooklyn. Doesn't it follow that you are in the United States? Yes, of course. And how does it follow? 
Does it follow on a matter of probability? Not at all. Because if you are in Brooklyn right now, it's not probable that you are in the United States, is it? It is necessary that you are in the United States. So this is an example of an argument that we call deductive. Why is it deductive? Because the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. Okay? So deduction, as I said, means that given the premises, the conclusion either follows necessarily or it doesn't follow at all. It's an all or nothing deal. Now, given the premises, if the conclusion does follow necessarily, we call that argument a deductively valid argument, or simply a valid argument. The example that I gave you before, this example here, is an example of a valid argument, because the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. On the other hand, if given the premises, the conclusion does not follow at all, then we call it, obviously, we call it invalid. You have to be careful here. Uh, pay attention because there are arguments that are valid even if they have false premises. Don't get confused. A valid argument is an argument that has premises that lead to a conclusion necessarily. And this does not include uh, or does not rely on whether the premises are true or false. Let me give you an example. If you live in Brooklyn, the Brooklyn, I mean the Brooklyn in New York City, you are in South America. This is obviously false because Brooklyn is not in South America but it's in New York State, which is in North America. The second statement says, guess what? You do live in Brooklyn. So what follows from statement one and statement two? I know that you, uh, you might not want to uh, say that because the first premise is false, but you are obligated to say that to conclude that you are in South America. So th this argument is a deductively valid argument because the conclusion is derived or deduced from the two premises. However, as you uh, can see, the first statement is false. Brooklyn is not in South America. So while the conclusion follows from the premises, from the two statements, the conclusion is false because the first premise is false. There is a particular name. The name is unsound. So an argument is unsound if and only if it is a deductive argument, it is also a valid argument. However, one of the statements is false. And in that case, we call it a, an unsound argument. Very well. A valid argument that has all true premises, then will have a different name. Now let's see. 
if a valid argument that has at least one false premise is called unsound, what do you think we call a valid argument that has all true premises? If you answered sound, you are right. A valid argument that has all true premises is called a sound argument. For example, all physical objects occupy space. My book is a physical object. Therefore, my book occupies space. This is a, a valid argument. It is a deductive argument. And uh, the premises are true. This is a good argument. So we call this argument a sound argument. But what if the conclusion does not follow at all? Well, we, uh, we call this an invalid argument, remember? For example, if you leave your car out on the street and it rains, your car gets wet. We know that this is true, don't we? If you leave your car on the street and it rains, what happens to the car? If the car is not under a, a porch or under a, or inside a garage, it's out on the street, what happens to the car? The car gets wet. Okay, this is true. Now suppose that I, I am looking at your car and the car is wet. Does it follow that because the car is wet, it rained? Not at all. The car can be, could be wet for many other reasons. For example, you, uh, you were using, uh, you were hosing your, uh, your flowers and you, uh, you splashed the car. Now the car is wet. So it doesn't follow that it, it rained on the basis of one and two. In other words, the conclusion does not follow at all. Perhaps I should give you a, a, more, uh, a more straightforward example. Here's the example. Premise number one. I have an uncle his name is Joe, and Uncle Joe likes spaghetti with tomato sauce. Premise two. It is very hot in August in New York City. Conclusion number three. I conclude on the basis of one and two, that St. John's University is in Queens. This is a bizarre argument, isn't it? But notice that all the three premises, all the three statements, the two statements plus the conclusion, are all true. Premise number one is true. I have an uncle. Joe, and he likes spaghetti with tomato sauce. That is true. It is also true that in August, it is hot in New York City. And it's also true that St. John's University is in Queens. However, based on the premises, the conclusion does not follow at all. Consequently, we call this argument an invalid argument. So invalid means that the conclusion does not follow at all. It doesn't follow from the premises. As I said, you have to be careful because an argument can be invalid when, when the premises are all true. Here is another example. 
less bizarre than than the spaghetti and the anko example. Premise number one: to be the president of the United States, you must be 35 years of age or older. True? Yes, that's true. Donald Trump is older than 35 years of age. True? Yes, this is true. Therefore, Donald Trump is the president of the United States. This is also true. But the point is this. How does the conclusion follow? Well, the answer is it doesn't follow at all. It doesn't follow that Donald Trump is the president of the United States, although it is true, but it doesn't follow from one and two. So when you uh, assess an argument, you always have to take into consideration what the premises of the argument state, not what is the case in the world. Yes, it is the case that Donald Trump is the current president of the United States. But if you uh, ask yourself, why is he the president of the United States? Well, because he has money, he uh, campaigned, he won the elections, he became the president of the United States. He's not the president of the United States because because to be president you have to be 35 and he is older than 35. Otherwise, anyone who's older than 35 could be the president of the United States. So the, uh, the conclusion, which is true, does not follow from the premises. Number two is a different way in which argument can be good. So just to uh, recap what I did in number one. Number one, we talked about in deduction. And we, uh, we were discussing what a good deductive argument is. A good deductive argument is an argument that has true premises and a conclusion that follows necessarily. In other words, sound arguments are defined as good arguments. Only sound arguments. Why? Because the definition of a sound argument is a deductively valid argument that has a conclusion that follows necessarily and all the premises are true. That is the definition of a good argument. Also, now we're going to talk about number two, induction. Good inductive arguments. Sometimes arguments are not intended to uh, support the conclusion um, in a, in a deductive way. Often arguments are intended to support a conclusion just by offering premises that will increase the, uh, the possibility, okay, the probability that something is the case. For example, every time I come to your house, your cat rubs against me. Today I'm coming to your house. What follows from these premises? It follows that your cat will rub against me. Now ask yourself, is the conclusion uh, necessary? In other words, is it going to happen? Well, typically when I come to your house, your cat rubs against me. So uh, the probability, chances are, we say, chances are, the cat is going to do it again. But suppose that your cat today doesn't feel like rubbing against me. That's a possibility, isn't it? And, and so what do we say about this argument? That the conclusion follows, but it follows probably. Okay? Follows probably. It's not necessary. Once again, if you, uh, if you 
feel lost at this point, let me uh, let me give you uh, uh, another example to uh, to understand what we're doing. Think about how the conclusion to uh, the arguments that I that I showed you earlier follows necessary. I have a triangle in my pocket. It follows necessarily that it has three sides. Your cat rubs against me every time I come to your house. Therefore, your cat will rub against me today. Well, you can see the difference, right? Uh, the the a triangle example, on a triangle example, the conclusion that my triangle has three sides is necessary. Can't be otherwise. But on this case, the cat case, the conclusion can be otherwise. It is possible that the cat this time will not rub against me for whatever reason. Okay. So, given the premises, the conclusion does not follow necessarily. Now, the question is, does it follow uh, necessarily? No. Does it not follow at all? No, it does follow. How does it follow? And the answer is, it follows probably. Okay? Probably. Um, if I say to you, how uh, uh, do you uh, commute to, uh, to the college? Well, typically, my father lets me borrow his car. So uh, today, I'm going to ask him again, and I'm going to drive my car to the college. You see that the conclusion there follows probably. Yes, your father typically lets you borrow the car, his car, but this time or next time, could be different. Okay? So if the conclusion follows probably in this sense, we are talking about inductive logic, inductive arguments. So given the premises, an argument is called inductive just if the conclusion follows probably. There are three kinds of inductive arguments. Inductive generalizations, arguments from analogy, causal arguments. Inductive generalizations are arguments that move from, from a particular sample or a particular observation to a general conclusion about a population. What I mean by population and sample is really either a person or an event or an object. Let me give you an example. I noticed that this desk in this classroom is brown. When I go to the, uh, the next classroom, the desk is also brown. Therefore, I conclude that all desks in, uh, in the entire college are brown. As you can see, this is that move that I was talking about from a sample, this desk is brown, that desk is brown, all desks are brown. A move from a sample to a general conclusion about a population. Who decides the population? Uh, the population depends on the arguer. You are using an argument, you decide which is the population. Say, for example, you go to a pizzeria in Queens, and the pizza is good to you. Then you go to a different one, and a different one, say, in a certain neighborhood in Queens. As a result of your experience, what do you say? You say, um, all pizzerias in, uh, in this area, serve good pizza. Now, you haven't tried them all. You have tried, let's say, 
three pizzerias. Suppose that they're in your area, in this hypothetical area of Queens, there are 150 uh, pizza places. You have tried uh, only 50 out of all the 150. Only 50 pizza places. And every time, good pizza, you eat good pizza. Now, on the basis of this, these observations, you say that all the pizzerias in, uh, in this particular area, all the 150 pizzeria, pizza places, must serve good pizza. On the basis of what? On the basis of your experiences of 50 good pizzas. So uh, the question is, how does the conclusion follow? Well, I follow probably. Is it a very strong conclusion? Mm, not very strong. What would make it a stronger conclusion? Well, certainly the number of pizzerias. The number of pizzerias. If you, uh, if you now go to, uh, um, say, 125 pizzerias, and you, uh, and you conclude uh, all pizza places in this area must be must serve good pizza. Then, as you can see, the conclusion becomes a little stronger. But still, it is not a fact that can be deduced from the premises. So the conclusion will never be um, necessary. It will always be a probable conclusion. The second type of inductive argument is what is known as argument from analogy. Essentially, when you, uh, um, when you offer an argument that contains an analogy between people, events, books, or would not, that argument is known as argument from analogy or analogical argument. For example, this book is boring. You read a book that is boring, and, uh, and then I, I give you another book that I just finished reading, and I tell you, oh, this book is fantastic. Now, you, um, you say to me, no, this book must be boring. That's your conclusion. And I ask you, on the basis of what do you uh, say that this book is boring? Well, because I just read a book which is very boring. Now, the book that you are giving me is written by the same author, and uh, it has a similar plot. It's the same genre, and uh, it has the same length of, of pages, is, uh, the same number of pages. So uh, it's, it is analogous in many respects to uh, my book, the book that I read. Consequently, I conclude that your book must also be boring. How good is this argument? Not very good. Not very good at all. You never should judge a book by, by its cover or the, uh, the number of pages. So, um, the conclusion, however, cannot be said not to follow at all. Conclusion follows with a matter of probability. Not a very good probability, but still it follows by probability. Not a good argument. The third kind of inductive argument is what is known as a causal argument. Every time you, uh, you formulate an argument, and in your argument, there is a causal connection, a causal statement. That argument is a causal argument, and by definition, it is a, an inductive argument, because the conclusion cannot be but probable. For example, I say to you that exercising a lot makes you fit. Uh, you are very fit. 
Therefore, you exercise a lot. This is not a good argument because, well, um, fitness is not something that you only achieve through uh, exercising a lot. There are also other elements to fitness. Uh, fever is caused by demonic possession. And you have fever, it follows that you are possessed by demons. This is also a causal argument. Why? Because in both arguments, notice that there is a causal statement. A causes B. Fever is caused by demonic possession. Demonic possession causes fever. Exercising causes fitness, and so on. Okay, to review what we have done, I talked about deductive arguments and inductive arguments. Notice if, well, if this video is working, you are looking at uh, my screen, you're looking at the slide of my presentation. If it doesn't work for some reason, uh, please hold up the, uh, uh, my presentation. Notice that on the one side, on the left side, we have deductive arguments. Again, what are deductive arguments? These are arguments that have a conclusion that follows either necessarily from the premises or it doesn't follow at all. Then we talked about valid and invalid arguments. Notice that valid and invalid are names, are labels that apply only to deductive arguments. There are no deductive arguments, there are no valid arguments on the inductive side, as you can see. So a valid argument is a deductive argument that has a conclusion that follows necessarily. Not a good argument yet, but it's on its way because it, it has a conclusion that follows necessarily. You remember that there are two requirements for a good argument. A conclusion that follows necessarily or probably. Okay, so check. That's the first, that satisfies the first requirement. The argument is valid. The conclusion follows necessarily. Um, also, there are invalid arguments. These are arguments that have a conclusion that doesn't follow at all from the premises. Remember, I, I, I keep emphasizing uh, from the premises because the conclusion cannot be said to uh, follow from whatever else. It, it has to follow um, from the premises that you, uh, you give. So, given the, the premises, if the conclusion doesn't follow at all, then we call that an invalid argument. And obviously, invalid arguments are not good arguments. By the way, let me emphasize also another point. So far, I have presented you arguments that have two premises and a conclusion. Three statements. But that's not the, uh, the only form of arguments. Don't think that arguments must have three statements. That's just the convention. That's just a way of making it easy for you and for me to explain. So arguments can have more than two premises. They can have three, four, five, six premises, okay? As long as they have premises and a conclusion. Now, I said that a valid argument satisfies one of the requirements for a good argument. Which one? Well, the requirement that says that a conclusion must follow either necessarily or probably. And a valid argument has a conclusion that follows necessarily. Now the second requirement, true premises. 
true statements. If an argument, in addition to being a valid argument, it has true premises, we call that argument a sound argument. And that is a good argument. On the other hand, if the argument is unsound, it means that one of the premises, at least one premise, one statement, is false. Not a good argument. Now, let's look at inductive arguments. These are arguments that have a conclusion that never follows all or nothing. Never follows necessarily or doesn't follow at all. It always follows probably. Now, the probability can be low or high. And, and so, uh, in that sense, we determine whether an argument is cogent or uncogent. So, if I present an argument that has a conclusion which follows probably, if the uh, premises are true, but the conclusion does not follow very likely from the premises, we, we, we should say that this is a, an example of a weak argument. And we call that an uncogent argument. It's not a good argument. Also, if the premises are false, whether the argument is strong or whether the argument is less strong, if the premises are false, it's not a good argument and we call it uncogent. The only cogent argument is a deductive argument. I'm sorry, I said deductive. Um, an inductive argument which has true premises and the premises are strong enough to support the conclusion with a high matter of probability, a high probability. So if the conclusion is very likely to be the case on the basis of the premises and the premises are true, that's a good argument and we call it cogent. So, if I ask you in the exam, in a test, tell me the name of a good argument. The correct answer would be, there are two possibilities. A, de a good deductive argument, the name of a good deductive argument is sound. And the name of a good inductive argument is cogent. So, test your knowledge. Most bachelors are happy. Mark is a bachelor. If follows, then Mark is happy. Is this a uh, deductive or an inductive argument? Well, this is an inductive argument. Notice that the first premise says most bachelors are happy. Mark is a bachelor. We don't have any more information than that. So it is possible that Mark is happy. But is it necessary? No, it's only possible. So this is a, a, an inductive argument. Is it strong? Mm, not, not really. You, uh, you might need uh, to give more information to make it stronger. Um, for example, restrict the number of, of people, of individuals, uh, by saying, for example, something like this. Um, most bachelors in uh, this room are happy. 
Mark is a bachelor. Mark is in this room right now. It follows, then Mark is happy. It's a little better. It's a little stronger as an argument, but not quite strong. Perhaps you can restrict it even more and make it even stronger, make it a cogent argument. You can say, most bachelors in this room are happy. There are, say, 20 bachelors in this room, out of which 18 are happy. Mark is a bachelor. It's very likely that Mark is one of these 18 bachelors and consequently is happy. Yet again, it's a little stronger than the, than the one before, but it's still an inductive argument. How about this? Eating soap gives you a stomach ache. You are eating soap, consequently, you, your stomach will ache. This is an example of an inductive argument because we don't know the future, first of all. We don't know what's going to happen. And uh, notice the, uh, the first premise. Eating soap gives you stomach ache. This is nothing but a uh, causal statement in disguise. It says, eating soap causes your stomach to ache. But it's a causal argument. Most philosophers are single liberals and untidy. Robert is a philosopher who is single and is liberal. Therefore, Robert is probably untidy. Well, this is easy. It tells you already in the conclusion. There's a clue. It says probably. Um, I'm not going to go over these other examples. You, uh, you can go over yourself and test yourself. What I want to do now is is talk about logical fallacies. Logical fallacies are mistakes that people make in, uh, in logic, in arguments. There are two uh, types of logical fallacies. What is known as, what are known as formal logical fallacies because they, uh, they are mistakes made by the form of the argument. And also there are informal logical fallacies. These fallacies are not uh, caused or due to uh, the form of an argument, but there are other reasons, reasons that we have to discover. A formal logical fallacy, to give you an example, is an error that can be uh, seen clearly in the following, following example. Take this argument. If Taylor is the President of the United States, she must be 35 years of age or older. We don't know Taylor. Who is Taylor? We don't know. It's a person. Now, what do we know? Well, we know that she is 35. But does it follow that she is the President of the United States? It doesn't follow at all because all we know is that if she is the president she must be 35 what do we know do we know that she's the president we don't know we only know that she is 35 but a lot of people are 35 and it doesn't follow that necessarily that they are 35 
uh, I'm sorry, that they are presidents of the United States. So uh, this example shows you uh, um, what, a, what an invalid argument is. Invalid arguments are formal logical fallacies. I'm not interested in these. I'm interested in informal logical fallacies, which are a little more uh, tricky than, than formal logical fallacies. So let's discuss informal logical fallacies. These are some of the most obvious logical fallacies, the most obvious mistakes that people make in, in reasoning. The first one is appeal to authority. In other words, when you, you make this mistake, when, uh, when you try to uh, support your argument on the basis of whatever a certain authority says. For example, Gordon Ramsay says that eating meat is morally permissible. Therefore, eating meat is morally permissible. Now, in this case, we have an authority, but the authority is not relevant because Gordon Ramsay is a chef, is not a moral philosopher. So uh, he can speak about um, recipes, about cooking, but not necessarily on moral philosophy, on morality, on what is moral and morally permissible or not. According to Einstein, abortion is always immoral. But once again, Einstein is not a relevant authority. And uh, my mother says that I'm the, uh, the most famous philosopher of this century. Well, she's not an expert, and besides, she is biased. So uh, any argument of this kind will be a, a, an appeal to authority. The next example is an appeal, another appeal, but an appeal to uh, the people. If you argue that your conclusion is true just because most people or all people say that it's true, you're committing the appeal to, a, to the people fallacy. Assume that you, uh, you uh, live during colonial times when slavery was accepted, was legal. Now, Jeremiah argues as follows. Slavery is morally permissible. You ask Jeremiah why? Because all people in, in all 13 colonies accept slavery. Well, this would be an appeal to, to the people fallacy. Doesn't mean that because the majority thinks that something is the case, it must be the case. Another example, people have believed in God for millennia. I don't see how so many people could be wrong. Therefore, God exists. But it's not the number of people who believe in something that determines the truth of that conclusion. It goes the other way around, by the way. If most people or all people are atheists, it doesn't follow that God doesn't exist. The next example is what is known as ad hominem, or a, um, it's, it's an attack to uh, the person. There are different kinds, abusive, circumstantial, and the, the, the so-called U2 fallacy. Now, if your doctor says to you, you should lose weight because you, um, um, you are not healthy at this weight. If I respond that my doctor must be wrong because he is fat, and I say, you should talk, you are fat, you're big, you must be wrong. 
that's an appeal to, uh, I'm sorry, it's not an appeal, it's an attack to uh, the person. In other words, the doctor can be right, okay? And uh, if the doctor is right, it's something that we have to determine on the basis of, well, other facts. Certainly not on the basis of his physical appearance. Okay, another example. Suppose I told you about the theory of evolution, I teach you about the theory of evolution. Your argument is that the theory of evolution must be false, or must be wrong, because I am an atheist. I'm not a, b a believer in God. As you can see, this is a, a personal attack. It has nothing to do with the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution, whether it's true or false or right or wrong, must be determined on its own merits, not on the basis of who is teaching you what. Another uh, common uh, mistake that people make is known as the slippery slope fallacy. Suppose that I say to you, we should op oppose same-sex marriage because if we allow it, what's going to happen is that eventually people would demand, will demand, to, uh, to get married to uh, their animals, to their cell phones, to uh, whatever. And this is absurd. We, uh, we cannot obviously allow people to uh, get married to uh, objects or animals. Consequently, we should oppose same-sex marriage for that reason. Well, your reasoning contains a fallacy. A fallacy is a slippery slope. Just to give you another example, I conclude that we cannot unlock our children from the closet. We have to keep our children inside the closet because if we open the closet, what happens? They're going to come out. If they come out, they start roaming around the house. And next thing that they do is they're going to go outside in the neighborhood and hang out there. And next thing, they're going to go outside the neighborhood. And what follows from that is that they, they will get kidnapped and killed. So, we cannot unlock our children from the closet because if we do so, that will lead to uh, the, their death. So because we want to prevent their death, we must keep them inside the closet. Now, obviously, this is a very bizarre, very extravagant example, but it gives you an idea of what a slippery slope is. It's essentially assuming that if you accept one uh, uh, condition, a series of uh, absurd or... Um, uh, undesirable, undesirable conditions. Just a sec. Sorry, I will uh, will come about, and so because we want to avoid these conditions, we also have to avoid the first one. Also, another uh, very frequent, frequently committed logical fallacy is the fallacy of equivocation. This occurs when, uh, when a conclusion of an argument uh, rests upon the equivocation of some, some words. For example, they told me that the body needs amino acids, but acids corrode your stomach. So I'm not eating amino acids. This is obviously a misunderstanding of what the word acid in uh, the, 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 the term amino acids really mean. Another example, logic helps you argue better, but do we really need to encourage people to argue? There's enough arguing and hostility in the world. Once again, this, this person is equivocating the word uh, 
the word here is argument. Arguing. Arguing in logic is not the same as arguing in uh, arguing with your neighbor about something. Humans are animals. Animals eat other animals. And that is not immoral. Therefore, humans eating other animals is not immoral. But now here also there is an equivocation. The equivocation is uh, that we assume that what applies to uh, human beings, human animals, must also apply to non-human animals. It is true that human beings are animals, but a different kind of animals from lions and zebras and tigers. We are non, um, I mean, I'm sorry, we are human animals. We have to qualify the, the term animals. Okay, the next one is begging the question. Begging the question means you are trying to uh, validate your argument. You're trying to uh, support your conclusion. How do you support a conclusion? You have to support a conclusion with premises. You can't support a conclusion with the conclusion itself. This seems obvious. So if I say Africa is the largest continent and this is my conclusion, how do I support this? On the basis of the fact that it, Africa has the largest area of any continent. But this is what it, what, what exactly what I'm trying to justify. So I cannot use a, provide as a justification the very thing that I, that I need to uh, justify. Or paranormal activity is real because I have experienced what can only be described as paranormal activity. Okay, but you have to, you still have to uh, define and prove paranormal activity. Let me give you another example. Um, how do you know that the book of God is divinely inspired because it says it right there in the third chapter that I quote all scripture is given by divine inspiration of God this also is begging the question all right the next one is the straw man the straw man is a logical fallacy that is committed when you uh, misinterpret or misconstrue the argument given by someone else. Uh, for example, the theory of evolution says that human beings come from monkeys. Therefore, the, the, uh, the theory of evolution must be wrong. This is a straw man fallacy because those who reason this way misinterpret the theory of evolution. Now, if you study the theory of evolution, you will learn that it does not say that we come from monkeys. Um, Zoe and Mike, what is your view on God? Mike says, I don't believe in any gods. And Zoe replies, oh, so you think that we are here by accident and all this design in nature is pure chance and the universe just created itself? And Mike says, I didn't say that. Where did you get all that? You are, as people say, you're putting words in my mouth. So this is a, a way of understanding what the straw man fallacy is. It's when you, are, when you put words in somebody else's mouth. 
The next one is the red herring. So this fallacy is committed when uh, you're trying to move the target away from, uh, from the discussion. I say to you, eating animals is immoral. And I give you some reason why. And you respond to me, but what about children starving in the world? That's a real problem. So what are you saying? Oh, I'm saying that eating animals is not immoral or is not a problem. But we were not talking about starving children, you see? So if you're talking about something else, you introduce a new topic, all you're doing is you're moving the, the target or you are, <clears throat> you are committing the red herring fallacy. There are other examples. You can look at the other examples. So I want to end uh, this very long very long lecture right here. Uh, if you have questions, please post your questions on uh, <clears throat> on a discussion board, and uh, <clears throat> and you can also um, email me your questions for clarifications. But remember, you should use uh, the forum to ask questions and clarify. I'm gonna ask a uh, an initial question. Um, and, um, and we move from there. Uh, so for now, this is all I needed to say to you. I hope you enjoy this long lecture. And uh, thank you. And I'll see you next time.